y'all? Your girl G here. We have Black and Crew New York to get into. I know I haven't really been able to do it like any of the other episodes. I think I might have reviewed the first one, but I kind of fell off after that because every time I tried to get into it, something else popped up. But if there was ever an episode to be able to get back into to review, it was last night's because it was good. I really enjoyed the fact that we actually got into the backstories of these characters individually more somewhat because I think we just get stuck on this like black and crew in the shop bullshit drama too much and it's just not really entertaining like how many times are we gonna go over the fact that teddy ain't doing nothing in that god dang shop all his big ass dudes go in there sit on the couch and do nothing teddy what is your freaking occupation title there other than you being demoted you need to be fired okay fired you don't bring nothing to the shop you don't tattoo you ain't no receptionist you ain't bringing in no business Caesar, let his ass go and we can no longer talk about how many times Donna's gonna get fucked in the bathroom okay we know that girl is out here in these streets already we know that like I really I just really really need some more substance when it comes to this show and so I really appreciated that last night we got a lot more of that especially with Walt and you know more or less with Young Bay. you guys Young Bay's story broke my heart like we saw her you know, take everybody to the shelter that her and her mom and her sister, you know, tried to live in to get away from their dad. And, you know, somebody can explain the pain that they go through as a child, but to literally physically see it come out of Young Bay, the type of pain that she had been holding in, because the way she screamed at that man was like, that's all she could do. She couldn't even speak to him half the time. She was just screaming because that's the only thing like you could tell that's the only thing she could do because she had been holding in for so long like I cried almost watching young bae cry in the confessional like you could tell he put that family through some real shit okay but we're gonna break down everything before we do though if you haven't already go ahead and subscribe to your girl's channel make sure you follow me on my other social medias as well my twitter and instagram and everything and then if you want to go ahead and donate to your girl cash up that would be appreciated too anything no nothing's too little okay and for those of you who have you know send a couple of coins this way definitely know that i appreciate it and it's going for some good use okay when it comes to this channel all right so nonetheless let's get into the episode so we see everybody at the shop talking about Walt's ass. Ain't nobody seen him after the engagement party. And what else do y'all expect from Walt? Y'all have been just such shitty friends to him to Walt. I feel so bad for Walt sometimes because he is, you know, the laugher, comedian, that they feel like he's always going to be in that mood and that he can handle all the stupid shit that y'all do to him. But I would be exhausted being friends with you guys because y'all just think it's funny to be fucked up to people and it's not. So Puma had to basically put it like, y'all, he's tired of us because every time it comes to him doing something, we end up ruining it. Y'all talk about his comedy show, y'all actually showed up late, wasn't even there on time. Then it came time for the dinner, the celebration, Scott fucked that up with her little evil ass ways, talking about Kitty and Ryan, that's when that news broke. And then you get to his engagement party and then Tati, now first of all, Tati, you deserve to get drop kicked in the chest for doing that shit, because that was foul okay and then secondly you've been doing this a lot of times this past couple of seasons i was kind of rocking with you when you first came on but now bitch like i don't like you right now because you have been doing a lot of foul you know sneaky behind the scenes stuff you think it was funny oh i was just trying to bring some humor into it what about that made sense to do that in this speech okay it was their engagement party what it was first of all if even if it was true that was not your business to tell tati like the fuck so then, everyone's like, well, no, nah, it just seems like there's more going on with Walt. He seems to be really getting into it. Y'all know how bad it is when he's drinking. Don't do that to Walt. Like, granted, Walt go through some stuff, but y'all trying to, like, make it a whole other huge thing. And y'all are assholes, okay? Sometimes just people being assholes towards you put you in a bad mood. Um, And then if, if it is that Walt's going through some stuff, Y'all are only exasperating the situation by doing, continue to do fucked up stuff to him and then sees your excuse for that. Oh, well, we're family. We, he knows this is craziness. That's our way of showing love. That's not what real friends do. Okay. And y'all say, oh, we hope he's not going through a lot. He's not getting into drinking and he's not doing all this stuff on his home. We hope he can, on his own, we hope he can come talk to us. Well, I'm sure Walt would come and talk to you guys a lot more if he would think that the shit that he would tell y'all wouldn't be constantly used as a joke. Because that's what y'all do. Anytime somebody be using like stuff to be vulnerable with you guys, y'all turn that shit into a joke. And y'all make try to make light of 
the shit that people really be going through. So no, Walt don't want to mess with y'all right now. And I don't blame him not one bit. So Bay, she ends up talking to Donna about her dad. The dad reached out and said that he wants to get in contact with her uh, while he's in New York. And of course, Bay does not know what to do because it's like, here's a man that literally tormented me all of my childhood to young adult life. And now he wants to see me. I don't even know what, what am I supposed to say to him? Um, and Donna did good consult. Y'all, half the time I like Donna and half the time I don't. See, this type of Donna I fucks with. You know, the type of Donna that can be there and listen and be there as a soft place to land on. We need a good hug because Donna got all that extra cushion for the pushing. You know, you can get a good old motherly warm hug out of her. But all the other times where she be doing all that other fuck shit, you can miss me with that. Um, but yeah, so she is contemplating whether she wants to talk to her dad or not. So Puma, he is trying to go back to the house to see Kwani because he thought he was going to get some midday booty, okay? He thought he was going to get some of that coochie in the middle of the day, some breakfast booty, okay? Or brunch booty, brunch booty rather. Um, But no, he thought he shot her a text to give her a heads up. He was on the way to drop some of that ding -ling. But he get home and her ass is still dressed with the kid in the bed. He like, why is he up? She's like, what do you mean why you up? It's the middle of the day. He said, you ain't get my text? She said, uh, no, I've been doing flashcards and a whole bunch of shit. He's like, girl, I tried to come home, you know, get a little Mr. Nasty time and we can't do, she's like, look, Puma, we got a son. We got kids. We can't do that no more. That's not going to happen. What a lot of you, you know, people, uh, underestimate as, you know, young adults or people get married and have kids, all that shit dies. Okay. You to my man, what happened to the spice in our life? What happened to the hot sauce we used to have? Kwani, no, Puma, you don't get to have that no more when you got humans running around your apartment you don't get to do all the freaky shit like have sex in the laundry room and have nasty sex on the kitchen counter and table and all that type of shit y'all don't get to do that no more okay so now he's like we need to you know get back to us and she's like yeah puma we will uh how about you take out the garbage or wash the dishes or feed the kids and change their diapers like i think men underestimate how much women really value you know helping out with housework and if you would help out with the housework, then she would actually have the energy to drop it on your ass, you know, right right before bed. That would make her more turned on to do that when you say, babe, you know what? I already handled everything. I washed the dishes. I took care of the kids. You ain't got to do none of that. You'd really be surprised with how much coochie would get thrown your way if you niggas would stop being lazy and expecting the women to do all the housework, okay? Um, but he's like, look, babe, I want this to get back to us, so I'm going to take you on a day. She's like, yeah, that's cool, but I'm going to plan it. Now, little did we know Kwani went into some freaky deaky shit and then pulled Puma into a dominatrix house. And am I tripping or did I see a pig mask? Like, I saw a pig mask, right? So now she takes him to this, like, incestuous, like, piggly wiggly dominatrix shop. And they go in and everything. And he's confused, like, what the hell is this? You even see a face coming out the wall. He's like, why do I feel like my face is going to look like that in 2.5 minutes? And so Kwani's all laughing and stuff. She thinks the shit funny. Um, but the lady who's the dominatrix, first of all, I'm sorry, I couldn't take this dominatrix seriously with this damn lisp. Okay. I feel like a dominatrix cannot have no lisp. I can't. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't take her serious. She just didn't look like she had that strong enough, you know, that assertive, that aggressive type, you know, aura about you that you need to have when you a dominatrix. Like, I don't take no shit. Like that type of, you know, aura. But nonetheless, she showed Kwani how to hog tie Puma's ass. Now he like, look, I done been tied up before, but not like this. She had him all wrapped up on his arms behind his head and behind his back. And she really went in there with that little red rope. And then on top of that, the girl saw his nipples poking out. Was like, ooh, you got some nice nipples for this. And tastes out like a little shock wand. And you see the whole like little lightning bolt hit Puma's nipple. The shit was funny. Kwani laughed because she saw it. He said, uh-uh, no, nope, not today, sir. Now, look, of all the freaky stuff that's going to happen in a bedroom or wherever it happens, I'll be damned if you try to electrocute my ass, okay? You would not be touching me with no electric boat. Now, I done accidentally shocked myself, you know, being dumb. I tried to plug in my flat iron. My hand was still wet. And I done felt that little electric boat all up in my hand. I'll be damned if you try to think that is some sexual you know, excitement. Now, I know there's people who enjoy pain in their life. You know, the weirdos who like being, you know, cut up and the clamps all up and down the nipples and 
private nether regions and stuff like that. But the electrocution, uh-uh, you miss me with that. But, you know, Kwani was just laughing and excited to get something, you know, different out of their relationship. So, okay, y'all, do you? Puma, you gonna be in for a rude awakening next time she, when, you know, you say you wanna spice it up. He said, if you, he said, I ain't this crazy, but if you know, you wanna be nasty and call me Mr. Robinson. I was like, the fuck? So then, um, let's get to Walt because Walt ends up going to his girl. I think it's, it's Jess, right? Uh, he pulls up to her apartment. She got a nice apartment. Like, what does she do? Because of all the apartments that we have seen on, you know, in New York and everybody else where they live, hers definitely is one of the nicest, if not the nicest. Um, but she was in there fixing some tea or whatever. And she's telling him how, uh, you know, she going to give him the key, the top key to the apartment and stuff. And he excited, but she kind of changes the tone when she asked him what was going on, especially after the engagement party. And he's like, look, man, I just feel like every time it comes time for me, you know, they fuck it up. They make it all about them. They're not really considerate of me. And I get that. Like, if I was Walt, well, I'd be so exhausted with that shit. And I think because he always is like the happy-go-lucky laughing when they think he can handle it. Oh, he'll just consider it as a joke. But no, sometimes the people who are the most outgoing and laugh the most are the ones going through the most shit. And I get it because I relate to Walt on that level because in my life, I have always been the strong, outgoing, make everybody else laugh. I've always been the one to do that for other people. And typically that's where that saying comes from. Comedians are literally the most fucked up people. And they typically are because they got to laugh to keep from crying. You got to make yourself laugh to get through the pain of all the stuff that you have been thrown in your life and all the shitty stuff that comes your way. So I relate to Walt on that level. But she brings up the idea of, you know, therapy to him because she's like, look, I don't want you going back that down that dark path. Obviously, he was dealing deal with the drinking and stuff. And he's like, man, I don't know about all that because, you know, the way I grew up is like, you know, life is life. You'll get through it eventually. Like, it'll make you stronger. It is what it is. And that's not healthy to think like that because when you think, oh, I'll get through it eventually. It'll make me stronger. Sometimes eventually never comes. Sometimes, you know, being strong is not I don't think being strong should be worn as such a badge of honor sometimes because being strong means that you had to be put through some shit and you're just entailed to handle it. And sometimes as a human, just with human, like with how we work, sometimes being able to handle high stress situations is not healthy and should not be healthy. Um, but Walt, you know, being a black man, especially it's viewed as weak and there's such a stigma with going to therapy um, especially, you know, I grew up too. You don't go to therapy. You don't talk about your shit with other people. Like what happens in the house stays in the house. And that's how we grow up, especially as black people, how we grow up. Um, but she finally convinced him to go and he's doing that for her because he loves her and he, you know, can't be unfair to her in the way that she's feeling. So they found this therapist. I really liked him. I liked how he kind of eased the edge off of it. He's like, you know, I do a little hood therapy over here. Like he was able to take the, oh, the the therapy part of it out you know he's like man you can just call me you know Andre or whatever his name was and um I think that took the edge off for Walt and I think it's a lot easier to talk to somebody when you feel like you can relate to them just on a basic human level so the fact that they were able to find a black male for Walt to be able to talk to I think helped them out a lot but nonetheless they want to do premarital counseling which I think is a great idea a lot of people don't see the benefit of premarital counseling y'all always want to wait till after y'all get married and this shit pops off 10 years down the line when, when both y'all been holding shit in for so long um and y'all just pop off on each other after y'all had kids and a whole bunch of shit going on in y'all's life and now your marriage is down the drain um but you know they start getting to infidelity and you know while having to fix you know the fact that he fucked around on Jess in the beginning they split up for six months because he admitted he's like look I was telling her I was ready to be committed and I wanted to be you know with her the rest of my life but I was still on the street acting single which is what a lot of you niggas do y'all say y'all want a real woman then when y'all get one and she try to hold you to the standards that should be y'all flip out panic and don't know what to do because y'all be messing out with these bimbo bitches who let y'all run out the street and do anything. Don't really hold y'all to the type of standards that y'all should be. But I really feel like Jess is the one for him. She makes him reconsider things. She actually makes him think things through. And I really enjoyed the therapy session, watching them do that. Um, and I really hope they continue to go. So 
On another note of uh, niggas who just messed up, we need to talk about Alex because his dumb ass, after Donna took him to the Museum of Sex, he thought, uh, she thought that was going to be the best way to ease him into telling him that her and Donna, uh, uh, Donna and Tati, they thinking about bumping coochies, they want to start being scissor buddies now. And she thought, you know, the Museum of Sex was going to ease up, uh, I guess, the awkwardness of him to, of her telling him. But he, as soon as Tati came up, He's like, yeah, 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 you and talk to your good friends. Enough about that, but let's talk about us. Now, Alex does start off talking, oh, babe, I want to be with you. We're going to spend the rest of our life together. You know, this is going to be good. Uh, all those words sound like this nigga's about to propose. Oh, no. Alex does the most hood nigga shit and says, baby, I want you to have my child. I want to impregnate you. What? Like, Alex, you is not one of, you cannot be one of those niggas who think impregnating somebody is what is shows commitment i can't like it's such the hood nigga logic oh i know i want to be with her i want her to have my baby that, that's the type of shit that niggas do right over y'all in the middle of having sex and get good and it's like baby i ain't gonna pull out i want you i want you to have my child i want you to have my seed and then dumb bitches from the hood think that's oh he really want me he want me to have this baby i'm gonna do it i'm gonna have that nigga baby because he loved me Bitch, shut up. Quit being stupid. You, if you don't take that plan B the next day, Donna, for the first time in her life, was actually mature logic in saying, no, I'm not going to have your baby. For him to be like, oh, oh, why we, can't we do it? And then halfway down the line, you know, you marry me. Like, we'll do the wedding then. Alex, what difference does it make? Four months? That's all? And you want to say, oh... But she's like, so I could be fat in our wedding? No, Alex, don't do that. Don't be one of those niggas that think having a baby is the way you're going to show commitment to somebody. Donna, for the first time in her life, actually made a rational decision. And I'm so proud of her acting mature. She said, I'm not having no baby. I'm 28, no kids until I get a ring. And I'm sorry, other than that, it's not happening. Okay? Now, she went to go tell Tati it failed, telling uh, Alex the plan about them wanting to be scissor buddies and whatnot. All of them want to be bump, bumping coochies and everything. Donna, I, what is it about Donna that everybody falls for? She must got the magical puss because everybody and their mama, every time they come to Black Ink, ends up falling for Donna shit. You remember when Donna was able to get Duchess cookies when she went over there to Miami for uh, Sky shit? And then Duchess tried to lie and say that Donna just, uh, took a, a advantage of her. Bitch, shut up. She was whispering them sweet nothings in your ear, was able to finger that cooch, and you enjoyed every minute. You know you wanted that cat eight, because he's wasn't doing it. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, you know, Tati talked to her about explaining to Alex about the whole kid thing, and her having the, the difficulties last time with her fallopian tubes being taken out and everything. Like, of course, that's another fear of Donna's. Like, what if this is such a high risk and is not good for both of us? Like, that's something they're both going to have. Uh, so let's get into the last part of the episode, which was Young Bay and her dad. Y'all, that shit was emotional. It broke me down. It truly and honestly did. I have never been so emotionally and mentally drained after watching an episode of Black Ink like that, okay? Um, Young Bay, I honestly feel so bad for you. The only thing I can do is pray for you, child, because... You know, she explained what she went through with her dad and stuff. And she even took the cast to the shed that her and her sister, her mom lived in. And as a viewer, you can only kind of picture yourself what you would do and how you would feel in a situation had that been happening to you. But to watch it physically come out of Young Bay by the way she was screaming at her dad was something different. Okay, it topped uh, the situation with Sky and her son. But how unfortunate that is, like this for some reason hit me 10 times worse than that did um because that's more explainable you know sky and her son but this is something different um she honestly i think first and foremost the bare minimum that she needed her from her dad was and i'm sorry and from the minute that nigga walked in i knew she wasn't getting it from his vibe his energy his aura the second he walked in with this damn i want to be a pimp from augusta hat on he walked in all all laid back and stuff I was like, oh, he on some fuck shit. I was like, he coming in to make excuses. He coming in to blame everything else on why he was such a messed up dad. And showing up, that's what he did. Bay couldn't even look at him, you guys. She reverted right back to being a child, scared, not wanting to look at her dad. Because if you look at him the wrong way, like, is he going to beat me up? Because when all I did was look at him, like, she couldn't even look. She started crying. And then finally, after crying for a couple of seconds, she's like, she sucked it back up. 
And she's like, no, I'm going to be an adult and I'm going to confront this man. And so, you know, he kind of starts with a little talk like, how are you? Whoop -de -woo. But Bay got right to it. She said, no, like you need to explain what did me and my mom and my sister do so bad to you? Why were you so angry and mean at us? Why did you put your hands on us every single day of our lives? And his excuse was, oh, I didn't know how to be a dad. Oh, I'm supposed to be a provider for this family. But, you know, extenuating certain circumstances wouldn't allow me to do it. And I'm sorry, y'all. I don't correlate those two. I do not correlate. I didn't know how to be a parent with physically abusing your child as a valid reason. I don't because at the end of the day, you don't need to be taught that putting your hands on your child is wrong. You don't need to be taught that. So no, dad, you don't get to use that as an excuse because regardless of what you go through and regardless of when you decide to have kids, you know that physically beating them up is fucked up and that's not what you're supposed to do. You don't need to be told that or like, I just, I don't get it. And so Bay flips the table on this nigga. She so quick through that drink and flipped the table and starts screaming bloody murder. Like, no, you need to say I'm sorry. No, why are you pretending and acting like you did nothing wrong? And he was shocked. I think he was shocked himself that that came out of Bay. I don't even think Bay knew that was coming out of her. I think she had a game plan going in, what she was going to say to him, what she was going to confront him about. But those emotions came that out of Bay that she was suppressing for a long time. And I honestly think this needed to happen. It needed to happen to be a moment where Bay broke down and actually let out the pain that she had been, you know, hiding for so long because she came to America running. And the first thing when she came to, she did when she got to America was, you know, work on her career and stuff. So she never really got a chance to just genuinely grieve everything she went through as a child. So she's screaming at the dad. He's not taking ownership. And then he wants to get upset talking about how am I supposed to tell you what, what's going on with, uh, when you're acting this way. So Bay is like, oh, really? I, want, I wonder how it must feel. But imagine how I was growing up and every day dealing with the fact that you beat me up, that I had a bloody nose, that I literally was got a fever from the times that you continuously kicked me. And for the dad to see that come out of Bay, I hope is a wake up call for him. And he doesn't come on this fuck shit next time. The next time he sees Bay needs to be the moment he comes with the real, true, ugly truth of, you know what? I fucked up. I did. And I'm sorry. It's like point blank period. There, there is no if, and, if, ands, or buts about it. But the fact that the only thing Bay could do was scream, broke my heart. She couldn't even, she was just like, no, let me talk to him. I need to know why. I need to talk to him some more. I got questions. I got questions. I need answers. And so the producer tried to get him up, but he got all mad, got an attitude, talking about, no, don't touch me. And so she flips the table back over and was like, okay, let's talk. Let's talk. Explain. What was it? What did we do to you? Were all three of us crazy? All three of us, you know, my mom left, my sister left, then me. So all three of us are lying. Like, they was not going to get nothing else out of it other than you know that man making excuses and then he wants to be like well no matter what i say you're not gonna listen and you damn sure you know what she wasn't gonna listen and you need to understand that was gonna have to be okay because at the end of the day what was needed in that moment was for young Bay to finally get all that shit out of her system and that's point blank period she needed to let it go let it out of her because she had been holding it in for so long uh, cause it's the first time she's seen you since all that shit happened. So yeah, she's not going to listen to you. And that's what you need to be as a dad for the moment was for, to be her punching bag. And that's the least you owe her because for all her childhood, she was your punching bag. So that's what you owe her at the least. Okay. But, um, but he ends up getting up after the producers make a move and you know, it just ends with her crying in the confessional. And the way she just broke down sobbing in the confessional, y'all, I ain't never felt nothing like that. And I can only pray that, you know, this is healing, a start of a healing for young Bay. Um, and that's where the episode ends. So y'all tell me what you thought about that. How did that, that affect your emotions? Um, for the preview next week, this nigga go take off running. He quite literally is running from his, you know, his duties as a dad and from his emotions because my nigga, you fucked up there, and that's that's all there is to it. And you got to understand those scars are going to live with Bay the rest of her life. And you couldn't even say, I'm sorry. That, and that was the first thing that should have came out your mouth. 
But no, you want to go take off running your little Asian ass. Got these people running around New York. Go get your ass stabbed. You ain't from New York, okay? Um, but then we see they end up confronting Nine Mag at the Philly, uh, the Philly convention. And of course, that's going to be really awkward. So we're going to have to see how that plays out next week. But y'all tell me what you thought about the episode. I appreciate you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to your girl's channel.